When I went into farms and started looking at frogs, a lot of people thought that these are not landscapes worth investing in. And most people would say you get five, six common species and what else are you going to get in a farm? We went to 180 plantations across Karnataka. So my expectation was more like 15 species of frogs in farms. But by the time data came in and we actually looked at what we were doing, we found that just in the Coog landscape, we were getting about 36 species of frogs only from plantation. Such a perfect stream. What's what? Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, there you are. Two are there. Step back, step back. If you were to fly from above and look down on earth, at a plantation, actually what you see is a forest. You see a diverse canopy cover. It almost looks like a broccoli from above. But you start going in and you realize you're not in a forest, you're in a plantation. And that's what agroforests actually provide, is a landscape that looks like a forest, but is agriculture also. Agroforests are consistently underestimated, like I said, and we didn't have much hope that they can support enough biodiversity to be called conservation landscape. But now our data shows that they are. They do support a lot of this. Hey, Shivu. Oh. Yeah, did you see this? It's that nifty but tracks of anti polyester eggs. Oh, okay. Remember, we saw this a few weeks ago also. Okay. But there are more eggs now. 19 eggs are there. Oh, okay. Wow. Hmm. I wonder if the adult is near there. Oh. You have certain frogs that are so dominant, which means they're so abundant that they take up almost all the seeds in the coffee plantations or other farms and other species that are less common. And uh, they have much lesser space to occupy. But what we are finding is the better you maintain your farm, there's less dominant structure, which means even the uncommon, even the rare species sometimes have more space to live in those farms. So if you go into a rubber farm, where literally you can walk through hundreds of meters and see only one species of tree, which is rubber, rubber and more rubber. It is not complex. That landscape is oversimplified, which means the frog community is oversimplified. All of the frogs are like two, three common species. Everything else is so rare, you almost never see it. So yes, there is a value to agroforest, but only when it's well maintained. A lot of our work happens at night, which is something that even many wildlife biologists find alarming because you can't see much farther beyond your flashlight at night. And this is a landscape that's rich in large mammals, right? You have everything from elephants, gauze, leopards. So when we are working in the night in these plantations, it creates a lot of fear within us, of course, but also within the plantation owners who are allowing us to come in and work in the plantations and other people who encounter us. And we've had to really be careful, you know, sometimes. Luckily, the NCF, Nature Conservation Foundation's effort, where they track where the elephants are, and they send us a text message every evening saying this is the locations the elephants are in. They've really kept us safe and our teams alive, <laughs> working in these challenging conditions. But we've also had some really silly, unexpected events where basically two people who were out in the field with us, their team members, and they were both relatively new. They were doing this work for the first time. We found out later that they didn't finish the work and came back saying there's an elephant there. But when I went with them out to other 
estates and other plantations later i realized that literally every falling leaf every falling branch they were jumping saying elephant elephant let's go <laughs> Oh, this is luteolus bacha. Abhi aaya hai. Ande se baar. So these frogs don't have tadpoles. They just directly emerge from eggs into baby frogs. It's so small now, it gets quite big. You look closely in the eye, it has a blue eye ring. It's quite beautiful. Last time you came, did you see uh, lateralis juveniles? Yeah, we have seen. We have seen these. So they've probably emerged a few weeks back already then. Yes. When we first started the amphibian project, it was in Karnataka in 2013. What was happening is not as much was known. There was no good field guide to amphibians of uh, the Western Ghats. We had to rely on papers which often are not giving the kind of morphological details you can identify in the field. It was a real struggle. Uh, yeah, so the temperature is 20.3 degrees Celsius. Okay. And the humidity right now is showing 100%. But what happened was we had a couple of birders in the group. First thing they use, very often you reach a place, you actually start with your ears. So instead when we started using our ears, we realized that you can actually distinctly tell each species apart just by their calls. At this point, I think I can hear Microhyla, yes. Trinotarsis, Indosilvirana, Euphlictus. I think at least nine species are calling easily. Almost all frogs communicate vocally, they use sound to talk to each other. But the dancing frogs are interesting because they use visual communication. This is because they live in these very, very noisy streams. So gushing water that's flowing through these rocks, it's making a lot of noise. They are also in high density. So if too many of them are calling on top of each other and in this all this noise of the stream, they really can't hear each other very much. So they use this other mode of communication where they stick up their legs into the air and they use it to wave and say, hey, this is my territory, you don't get to be here. Or they also use it potentially to attract mates. Yeah, so basically, they'll keep uh, like coming to the ground now, and uh -huh. then they'll, the female will dig, okay. and she'll lay the eggs, uh -huh. and then cover it up. It's very cool. But just a few meters back, there was another female. Okay. I saw her dig actually, with uh -huh. the male on top of her, but I missed watching the egg laying. Okay. Yes, we're going out, and we want to understand how biodiversity adapts to habitat loss. And we've collected data and lots of it over the last several years. I've had at least six years of monsoon that I've spent entirely in the Western Ghats. And all of that at the end of the day will become a scientific publication and sit somewhere that another 10 scientists may read or may not. <laughs> but it doesn't reach a wider audience. It doesn't really have an impact unless you take it back to the planters, the landowners. Who are the stewards of this land? They are holding on to enormous biodiversity and whether accidentally or intentionally, supporting that biodiversity. So we need to make sure that this information gets back to them. And we've been trying to do that now, engaging more often with them, talking to them about what we are finding so that it builds a sense of excitement in them about all these endemic rare species that are in their farms. But also eventually to see are there little tweaks you can do in the way you manage your landscape. You have a little pond that exists in your farm. 
keep it as it is if you have some shrubs growing around that pond don't cut those shrubs you know these little things or even some people actively want a lily pond right outside their house and you'd be surprised how much a little lily pond can offer as habitat for frogs so healthy fast flowing streams that have these pools riffles and cascades different types of water flow is very important for the health of frogs and so if planters are able to manage their streams in such a way that they're not affecting the stream edges they can really do a lot for conservation bopana this is the stream i was telling you about when okay. we were talking earlier uh -huh. this is a fantastic stream because as you see it mm -hmm. it's a it's very natural in its state right there's okay. lots of fallen rocks and things correct and what's very important in this stream is uh -huh. that there are no coffee or cardamom bushes up to the stream edge correct it's natural vegetation on the stream edge yes. that adds a huge conservation value to the stream mm -hmm. which is why so many interesting frogs okay. are able to live in this stream got it if you it's keep a, it natural you mean yeah, to say yeah because okay. it's natural uh -huh. but mostly they depend on insects frogs yeah so they are like great pest controllers actually frogs. okay uh huh and also tadpoles uh -huh. they sit in the stream bottom right okay and they eat up all the fallen vegetation okay. other dead organic matter uh -huh. so they keep the water also clean okay the tadpoles of the frog this frog that i'm about to show you uh huh so it's right there under that rock where okay. we're going to go uh huh so this is big okay. nice frog that's uh -huh. sitting there Oh yeah we again yeah this very very interesting frog and we've literally seen it in two plantations in all our study sites and they're very uncommon because they need that healthy forest like stream which most plantations don't offer and also they are elevationally restricted the male will sit in a rock cave of his own that's his territory his kingdom and he will call and call and call and wait and a female if she's interested in him will come she will mate with him and she does a full handstand so her whole body weight is on her hands she's upside down and she lays eggs on the roof of the cave and the male sits there and guards the eggs and takes care of them until they're ready to hatch but he will also continue to sit there and call and hopefully another female comes by and the same process repeats tanders surprise me uh i often go with a mentality that this is their business this is their livelihood so they're in it for the money so me coming here saying hey look at some frogs and be interested in them is not going to carry weight yeah. so what did you think about this frog it's completely different yeah. now had this experience it's so much like different compared to like other animals yeah or maybe other species as well but i never knew about this like and i'm surprised by how often i get a response from them about curiosity engagement interest they want to learn more and more often than not they do want to know what they can do to improve the biodiversity they do want to know you know what it is they can do to support So what we've been doing is with this acoustic monitoring we're also comparing it to monsoons which is the main thing that drives frogs right when do we come out to the western ghats the first rain and when do we last see frogs usually the end of the last rain so they're here in the monsoon and they're literally driven by that season and it's very important for them what's happening is that stream frogs and pond frogs even there's a little bit of water in the stream or in the pond they're able to use that water and they're breeding even in a year where there is a complete collapse in the amount of rainfall interestingly though bush frogs are a group of frogs that don't have tadpoles so they lay eggs directly in the ground usually in the soil under leaf litter when the eggs hatch they don't have tadpoles they come out directly as little baby frogs and you'd think this group doesn't need water right surprisingly though that's the group that's most affected by monsoon because the monsoon keeps the land wet it keeps the air moist and those are very small amounts of water so if that is not then that's dry they're not able to survive
India has about 5% of protected area coverage. When you come to the Western Ghats, that number is a little bit higher. We have 9% protected area coverage. But what we have is over 30% of the landscape, that's just plantations. This is a massive amount of area that's tree cover, but isn't managed for wildlife, it's managed for crops. But that doesn't mean it can't support the wildlife. It clearly can. And so we need these plantations to boost what the protected areas provide. And since they are right at the edge of these protected areas, they need to also keep in mind that these have to be sustained in the long term. And I think we're getting there, hopefully. And when you have such complex landscapes with forest patches and people and communities and plantations all together, and I think it's important to embrace that and recognize that we live amongst a very diverse system. What is interesting about the work I do is, I can take it back, all of this information that we collect, to the planters, have a conversation with them, collaborate with them, and hopefully bring about some positive change for this landscape, in a way where we can all sustainably live, right? Whether it's the people, but also the fish and the snakes and the frogs and insects and plants, can all coexist. And especially in a world of climate change, that becomes important. And that, in whatever way my research can contribute to, that's what brings me the joy and satisfaction. Mm -hmm.